Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Nee Klax. I'm the Education Programs Manager for Grand Staircase Escalante Partners. We are a nonprofit organization committed to honoring the past and safeguarding the future of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument um, and supporting and promoting its scientific and cultural resources. We share monument science through educational programs, carry out restoration and monitoring projects, and advocate for land management policies that support the biodiversity of this region. I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's Ask an Expert virtual event. We started these events to create opportunities for you to connect with and learn from the myriad experts who have worked in the Grand Staircase Escalante region and have expanded our understanding of GSCNM landscapes and ecosystems. In slight contrast to our community lecture series, our Ask an Expert events are meant to be a more informal Q&A with our conversation following the direction of our audience questions. Before we dive in and hear more from Dr. Stevens, uh, I'd like to provide a quick review of how to ask questions in the Zoom webinar format. So the first way you can ask questions is to submit a written question in the Q&A box. So if you mouse down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a little Q&A icon. Click on that, it'll give you an opportunity to enter a question, and then I'll receive those questions and ask them in the order that they're received. Um, you can also use this Q&A function if you're having any sort of uh, logistical issues, uh, go ahead and shoot me a question and I'll um, help you take care of it. The other way you can ask a question is um, orally or verbally. So if you'd like to raise your hand to speak out loud, mouse down to the bottom of, bottom of your Zoom screen, click the raise your hand icon and I will get a notification. Um, and when it's your turn to ask the question is up, I will allow you to unmute and you can ask your question. So this evening, uh, we get to hear from Dr. Michael Stevens. Uh, Dr. Stevens is Professor Emeritus of Plant Genetics and Plant Breeding at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. He is still actively researching uh, on developing new cultivars of penstemon for use in the arid western urban landscape with significantly less water use. Dr. Stevens, along with two other colleagues, recently completed a book on the 76 penstemon species of Utah, um, and that book was released this month. Dr. Stevens lives in, in Orem, Utah, with his wife. Uh, so I'll now turn it over to Mike, who will give us a brief presentation of his work, and then we'll open it up to questions. Hi, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Am I set up okay, Neek? Yeah, um, go ahead and share your screen uh, okay. if you'd like to share those slides. Okay. Oh yeah, first of all, I've got to uh, do that. I apologize. Uh-oh. Here we go. Okay, hopefully you can see that now. Are we yep. okay? We're all good. All right, good. Uh, this is just a picture of the cover. Uh, we began this work over uh, uh, 10 years ago. I and especially uh, Dr. Stephen Love, the second author on there. Uh, the both of us have had a long history in native plants. Both of us are plant breeders by training. Uh, he worked on potatoes and I worked on tomatoes. Um, and a couple of other crops. And towards the end of my career, I said, I'd like to retire playing around with native plants, trying to find things that would be useful in urban landscapes that would be more drought tolerant. And nobody's really played with that. So that was, I needed to understand uh, the, the crop I was going to choose. And over time, um, several weeks, a month, <clears throat> I uh, spent with colleagues looking at various wild natives and penstemon kept repeating. And so when we finally got it decided that we would do penstemon, um, I realized that uh, in a few weeks time in studying them, there was a lot to be learned. And so I began that process and over 10 years later, uh, it culminated in this book. So I'll share it with you, at least the overview on it. And then we can talk about 
our overall objective of doing urban landscape uh, type uh, natives uh, because uh, I have a long background, a greenhouse background and everything else uh, of that nature, horticulture. And so I understand what the urban land, uh, uh, the homeowner, a uh, business owner would like to have in their yards. And I also understand we're going to be in more and more trouble with water. We ought to be looking at things that are uh, native to our region instead of bringing beautiful, but nevertheless water hungry plants in uh, uh, from the outside. So that's the, the uh, reason why. Uh, so let me just share a few fun things we learned about uh, Penstemon uh, in the last uh, 15 years or so, especially the last 10 as we locked down on it. There's over 280 uh, Penstemon found in North America mostly and a little bit in Central America. 89% uh, of those found in North America are from the uh, Western United States, telling us that the vast majority of genetic diversity, uh, uh, diversity of species are found out here in the West. Most of them are drought tolerant. In Utah, there's 76 that have been reported uh, to be found in Utah. Uh, that's a pretty big number. And I'll, sh I'll, I'll give you some relevance of how big a number of, of species that is in a moment. Uh, we re-identified 74 of the 76. Two of those are rather ephemeral. That is that they, are here. We know that they are, uh, every indication suggests they're natural, but they either may be gone or they only appear on occasions in the, in, in the population. Uh, that represents 27% of all the known pensamen uh, across all of, the, of North America and into Latin America, Central America. 13 species have two or more uh, varieties found here in Utah. By way of comparison, as I mentioned, Colorado has 63. We share some of those with Colorado, 61 in uh, California, 54 in uh, Nevada, 51 in Arizona, um, and 45 in New Mexico, uh, 45 in Wyoming, and then uh, across the region of Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho, there are a little over 80 species um, out there. So uh, Utah definitely has the lion's share of diversity, making us kind of the, uh, the king on the hill, which as I began to understand it, uh, that, made, that made a really interesting uh, project to have to learn all of this stuff. Uh, that's why we ended up with a book because there was so much to learn. From there, uh, we have found evidence of two additional undescribed uh, taxa in Utah. That, what I mean by that is we found two um, species, or I shouldn't call them species because we're not sure that they would be labeled as species. One is more of a variety. The other one might be a species when we get finished doing all of our research on it. But in our, in our work, we actually found two that had never been identified before. 22 uh, species are solely found in Utah. That's uh, when you use the word endemic, it simply means they are not found elsewhere. They're very narrow um, in where they live. And 22 of those 76 are only found in very small areas of Utah. Uh, by the way, that 22 is a little misleading because there are three or four that sit right on the borders of states that are really narrow. They're very small. Um, a few hundreds of acres in a couple of cases would, would describe a couple of these species. They're find, uh, found right up in the corner. Uh, one of them is found up in the corner of uh, Utah and the, by Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming. A second one is found down in the corner by Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. Like I said, these are uh, really small, but they're found right in the corner area. And the third one that I can readily think of is found in the corner of Utah, Idaho, and Nevada. Uh, that one is extremely small. Hortic uh, historically, um, Barbados was the first species named, uh, which is found in Utah. Now, this named uh, species was not uh, first discovered in Utah. They actually found it in Mexico. They collected it and sent it back to uh, Spain and it was described in 1795, but this species is found in Utah. The, uh, the uh, graphic over on the far right is the original drawing of that out of the 18, or 1795 public 
location. The first species actually described from samples actually collected in Utah was one found over in uh, the Uinta Basin uh, called Fremontii. Uh, it's named after John C. Fremont and he collected it on May 31st, 1844 and his notes say uh, hillside of Duchesne Fork, which is out there by Duchesne. Uh, that's a photo of it uh, over on the right. The most recent named taxa was a variety named after um, uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Atwood, and it's named after, uh, he named it, but he named it after his wife, Judy. Uh, and uh, it is found up on, uh, he originally found it up on Mount Tippinogus, has now been found in three or four other very high altitude places, and it, it's a, uh, a recognized variety. By 1850, nine of the 76 species had been described. So uh, by the time uh, the uh, pioneers were first arriving here in uh, the Utah region, um, they had uh, been here just a few years and nine had already been described. Uh, was not by the original pioneers, but people who were exploring the West. By 1900, 31 species had been described, which are found in Utah. The most recently described species is one called Franklin I. It's named after Dr. Franklin um, from uh, up in uh, U uh, University of Utah. And it is found in Cedar Valley. Uh, it is in the north end of uh, the area of, of Cedar City, up that valley in there. It's only, and it's a very narrow endemic. And it was found in uh, 1993. Four of the early described pensamen were described and illustrated in the 1800s. Uh, and you can see these beautiful illustrations. We, uh, uh, because these are no longer held under copyright, we included these uh, in the book and I thought they turned out really fantastic. But uh, these are of various species found here in Utah. In general, uh, uh, more pensamen species in the southeastern or southern half of the state, down where you guys are at, Kanab and, and that region, uh, you get the, uh, the southern half, uh, southern two thirds of the state, and the vast uh, number of uh, varieties or species are down there. However, one exception to that, and that's in the Uinta Basin. Now, there are, uh, I have asked lots of questions as to why. There are 17 species found there in the Uinta Basin. Seven of those are extremely narrow endemics. Two of them are being argued back and forth and have been in the courts repeatedly uh, being looked at as a, um, a, a, an endangered species. And uh, you can find a lot of information about those two uh, species out there as being you know, potentially endangered. Uh, the Utah, uh, it can be found in all sorts of areas of Utah from 2,900 feet uh, uh, in the Mojave Desert to over 12,000 feet. And examples of those are on the right side of your screen. Uh, the, the top one is uh, one called Petiolatus. I um, gave that one a nickname. Uh, my first time that I ever saw it, I was hunting for it. I was following uh, records that had existed saying it was going to be in this era, this region. And uh, all of a sudden I saw this brilliant pink uh, growing right where this rock, this particular photo was taken. And uh, I, of course, being someone uh, interested in uh, wildflowers, I wanted to see what it was and suspicion it might be a penstemon. And I brother, I came to a stop rather quickly. And so I've since then had my own fun name for it called Skidmark Penstemon. It's in the gravel, so obviously that skid mark has gone a long time ago, but it caught my attention uh, that fast. The lower right uh, corner one is uh, Uinta ensis. That's, uh, you don't even fi start finding that until about 10,000 feet, and it continues up in elevation, at least in the areas that I have found. So it's, it's way up there. A little short guy, that's right in the Alpine uh, area. Uh, they live in clay, they live in sand, they live in rock. They live in organic soils. They grow in all sorts of places. Down there near you guys, there in Kanab, 
Uh, the lower left photo is of uh, one called Amophilus, and it grows only in the blowout sands of that region. A really fun uh, 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 plant. In fact, the sands will blow over the top of it, bury it, and it'll just pop out and start growing in a new location. When I went to collect a sample for the er herbarium uh, for that one, I dug down and found lots of old plant that had been buried in time. Uh, they live in both dry and moist conditions. However, uh, they really love the dry conditions. The vast majority of them are uh, drought loving or at least drought tolerant. The reason why there's so much diversity, there's a lot of science going on in, uh, in studies trying to understand it. It appears as if the pollinators are the uh, heavy driving force to why there's so much diversity in species. Uh, the hummingbirds, if you find red ones, which you do down there in uh, your part of the world, the hummingbirds are the responsible party for that. That photo right there happened to be, uh, I wished I'd have been able to uh, shoot the, at much higher speeds. It was a cloudy day, a storm was coming in, and I was actually trying to photograph the plant, and the hummingbird came in and was enjoying itself, so I just went ahead and photographed the, the, the hummingbird. I just wished I could have had stop action for the wings. Uh, all of these other insects were actually pollinators uh, and there's many, many, many more that I could show. So why is it that this particular genus, the Panstemon, are so widely cultivated throughout the world and yet none of them are from drought tolerant areas and the majority of the species are from drought. Very little use of our germplasm has been used for landscaping. And yet, in the 1800s, by 1830, in the 1830s, the first commercial pensman, a hybrid pensman, were being grown and sold in Europe. Uh, in the 1860s, all of these beautiful lithographs right here uh, are from uh, a German gardening magazine uh, and demonstrating that uh, a great love for these uh, penstemon, uh, and they were growing them uh, all. But if you have to st you stop and think about it, what happened at the end of the, the 1700s? Well, we uh, just finished up with a civil war. Uh, someone called it, the uh, British called it a civil war. We call it a revolutionary war where we separated from England. And so, uh, they had managed to get some plants to Europe and they, they love plants, all things European, all the Europeans loved all American plants and they were bringing them over. And they had a lot of gardeners and they had contests and they were growing beautiful plants, but they had hardly discovered the Western United States at that point in time. So the only genetics they had to work with were Midwestern and uh, Central American uh, germplasm. So that's why most of the uh, pensamen of the world today are from this really 200 year old uh, genetics and still being used. Uh, there are people now working with the drought tolerant materials, but it's gonna take a while before we can catch up to 200 years of breeding. This is what the book looks like. It's uh, a, 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 a rather a beautiful cover. I had a fellow from uh, down there in St. George, actually our third author, Tony knew a, a fellow that uh, did a wonderful uh, book art uh, uh, the cover for us. And so we worked with him. Otherwise, we'd never have got it because we've done this on a shoestring. Uh, the forward, the forward was written by Dr. Noel Holmgren. Uh, Noel is a world-renowned penstemon expert. Um, he's named uh, many, many species himself. Uh, he's received a number of re uh, awards. He's in his 80s now. And uh, I, I count him as a good friend, and he wrote the foreword for us. Uh, the introduction to the, the book talks a lot about some of the history that I just talked about, some of the background. And then we start to talk about the geography, the distribution, the categorization of it in chapter two. In chapter three, we discuss the ethnobotany in Penstemon. Uh, the natives of, of the Americas, uh, had learned a lot about their plants because they were living with them all the time. And uh, strangely enough, uh, pensmen show up rather regularly in their lore and in their uh, medicine. 
And so uh, we, wherever we could find information, we included that information in each chapter on each species or each section of, of the, that chapter. We then talk a little bit about the horticulture of, uh, and cultivars that have been developed, followed in the next chapter uh, by uh, the taxonomic classifications of those 76 species in Utah. We, because Penstemon, for a few of you, or maybe many of you already know, uh, classification in Penstemon is rather challenging. And they use the uh, sexual parts in the plant to actually uh, do the classification. And you have to look at the anthers, you have to look at the, the flower, you have to look at how it's shaped, uh, you have to look at all that stuff. You measure all those parts, you look at the beard tongue, which, which is a, um, is a, uh, what we call the staminoid or beard tongue. And all of those things are what make up the classification. That makes it really challenging. And so over time, I and my colleagues put together a table in which we photographed everything in intimate detail. And then we described that in this table, making classification much easier. I've heard several people say, this is the most important part of the whole book. Uh, then we do uh, a dichotomous key. Uh, we try to explain some of the technical uh, language. Uh, is, uh, and, and so we have an index of the, uh, or excuse me, a glossary at the end of the book. I'll show you some of that in a few minutes. The key is a uh, typical uh, key. We used Holmgren uh, as our guidepost to run the key uh, with modifications with a couple of other authors to help us focus in only on Utah Benstamen. So chapter seven, now this is where the book really begins because we're only into 54 pages at this point in time. And at this point in time, we take each species and we uh, discuss it. We give it the name, uh, a name and a history about it. We talk about its taxonomic classification with a, a few, uh, one sentence. And then we talk about similar species. So you look around and you say, wait a second, this one looks a whole lot like that. What's the difference? We tried to identify some of those. What's the difference? And put it on there and say, why is Abietin uh, that much different than the rest? We talk about the range, the habitat, blooming period, general description uh, of the, the plant. In layman terms, we try to use every bit in that, in that general description as much as possible in layman terms. Then we use a technical description for those of you who want to get into that. That uh, shows you the, the basic uh, thing is uh, uh, up, uh, from chapter uh, seven on, we have all the species. In chapter eight, we talk about all the contributors that have uh, uh, worked on the, the various pensmen involved in Utah. Uh, there's 106 individuals that we actually discuss. The references, there are over 480 references. For those of you who are big into uh, understanding where did he get that information from? I ask that question constantly. And because I'm asking it, I decided someone else out there might ask it. So I kept track of every place I got my references from. And I and my colleagues made sure that we did as good a job as humanly possible to be uh, faithful to those that have gone before us. The glossary is uh, approximately 281 terms. Uh, 46 have associated photos, which are, I'm showing over on the right side right now. So uh, if we talk about a particular term, we have a photo of it over on the right side in at least 46 instances. Uh, and then we have an index uh, at the very end. So uh, that gives you uh, a little thought about it. There's over 800 uh, photos. It's a 400-page book approximately. And it weighs about five, a uh, little over five pounds. Um, and it's uh, about like a notebook in size. It is the, one of the first comments of the first person who saw it after we, um, uh, I, I started revealing it to general public because they had sent me a, a, a preview copy. And she immediately says, oh, she says, this is like a coffee table book. And I says, oh, I'm so glad to hear you because you say that because that's exactly what I was hoping people would feel like, that they could set it on their coffee table and still learn something from it. Those are uh, the authors, myself on the left, 
uh, an excellent top-rate uh, co-author of Stephen Love. Stephen and I are about the same age. And uh, we, like I said, we have this long history uh, and yet we never met until about 2008 at a, a, a national Penstemon meeting. And since then, the two of us have been dear and close friends. Um, he is an amazing person in every respect. He's had a massive heart attack and he actually uh, has a artificial heart that he carries around and he's still hiking the, the back country uh, as far as he dare gets with two batteries. So Tony McCameron uh, is a, an individual who has a lot of ethnobotany background and Steve knew him and so brought uh, uh, Tony into the story and Tony's helped us with, with that. Finally, I guess uh, I tried to add this in really quick at the end, but I don't think that it's uh, really will show up. Uh, we need to thank, uh, the book is, uh, should be well into three digits. It, we're selling it for $65 because we want everybody to do it. There will be no money made on this at all. It's uh, virtually impossible uh, to do it. Uh, American Pensimus Society gave us a grant. Uh, Charles Red Center uh, for Western Studies at Brigham Young University uh, gave us a grant. And the Utah Native Plant Society gave us a small grant. And then I took research funds and some retirement funds to finish off what we needed to do. But that gives you the background. So I'm open for questions at this point. Great, thank you so much uh, for that introduction and uh, congratulations on the publication of that book. Um, so our first question is from Mike, um, who asks, for the two undescribed uh, new Utah taxa of Pensamen, are they un uh, just undescribed in Utah or is it undescribed more broadly speaking? It's undescribed full stop, nobody. All right, very cool. It's, yeah, it's, they've never, they've been hidden in amongst other plants. Uh, they, they've been named something else for quite a while. Okay, great. Um, the next question from AJ is, when you say narrow endemic, are you referring to range or to population size? Uh, a range usually. Um, in the case of the one that uh, I mentioned that's up in the uh, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming corner, that actually ranges but are only found in three spots up across mostly Wyoming, but each spot is rather small. So the range is kind of large, but each population is rather small and, and each population's range by itself is small. So. Um, and uh, physiologically, what makes these Utah penstemons and other drought tolerant um, species so well adapted to arid environments? I think that there's probably several things involved. Mostly, I'm guessing that they are using a, a more of an avoidance. They have a tolerance to being dry, but they have deep root, root systems. Uh, which help them uh, go out and reach for where water is at. Uh, so that helps. Uh, they can tolerate being dried down uh, more than other species. And from there, there's not been a lot of other research to help us. We know that if you put them in a container, keep the roots confined, that they will last a little bit longer than most of the others, but they will also, you can kill them by drying them out too much. Very interesting. Okay, um, so we have a couple questions about uh, pollinators. So the first is, are there penstemons with species-specific mutualist pollinators? And if so, which plants and with, with which pollinators? Um, usually there are some, some bees. And I have, I'm not a good one to answer the pollinator syndromes that we're seeing. Um, it, it, it is really quite interesting. There are a number of scientists actually working on this uh, pollination kind of uh, question. Um, one of them, I just met this spring for the first time. She and I have been interacting, but she came here to Utah to look at the syndrome going on with uh, the, uh, the red one, Barbados. Uh, and she's asking the hummingbirds slash the other species that are uh, feeding on it. Uh, and so, yeah, some of them appear to be really narrow, 
but I can't help you on which species, uh, 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 insect species uh, that there are. Does that, is that addressing the question or is it, or need some refining? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that, that uh, points us in the direction of where we might look further for that. Um, another uh, pollinator question um, from AJ is, can you talk a bit more about how pollinators drive Penstem in diversity? Is it a one-way street with pollination prompting plant variation or can it go both ways um, in terms of encouraging, encouraging pollinator diversity? Um, I, th I, th I think number one, uh, the genome, the, the genetics of Penstemon are still dynamic. There's, there's a lot of variability uh, available. Uh, so that allows uh, what we refer to as plasticity, meaning that it can be pushed and pulled uh, by nature. Uh, it's not locked into something. Uh, and so uh, if a new pollinator uh, is, begins to pollinate, then that, it, the, the two would possibly drive towards each other. If the pollinator favors a particular color more, that would then drive uh, the, the plants flexible enough that it would be it would allow itself to start moving that way and it would not be a hard adjustment for that plant uh, to do it because it's got the flexibility in its genetics already. Mm -hmm. the, um, there, there is a wonderful story going on down in your part of the world. Uh, it's in Zion. Uh, it's down across the border uh, near the coral uh, sand dunes uh, uh, area. Um, it's one called Jonesy Eye, and I, uh, there was a publication that just came out, and you can hunt that down. Uh, it's Pensament X, meaning a hybrid, Jonesy Eye, and we just published on it, and there's a couple of fun articles out there. Zion uh, uh, Partners just did uh, released our publication on that, and we're noting some interesting uh, aspects. When it crosses, it crosses between a wider blue and larger flower and the tight uh, uh, tube-like flower of Etonii or Eaton's pensament or firecracker pensament. And it's crossing between these two and the hybrid between the two look like it's halfway in between, but you don't see that hybrid very often. You see the next step back towards more towards the tube type, only it has a burgundy color. And so that's what's been recognized as this burgundy colored um, uh, firecracker. And everybody's saying, well, that's a very interesting and unique penstemon. Um, and, and it was given the hybrid name and it was hypothesized. Well, our, our research demonstrated that it definitely is hybridizing easily. And the, one of the offspring can be that, that they can be pink, they can be orange, they can be pastel, but the majority of them end up with this deep maroon um, burgundy color. Uh, and, and, and I'm asking the question, why do they end up back towards that color? And my colleague from North Carolina, she's actually wanting to ask that question in a deeper sense, uh, driving this question further and further. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Our next question from Susan is, do you have any specific counts or lists of pensament types that are found in the Grand Staircase area? Uh, I once, and I should have done that for this, I once did it for an earlier presentation. Um, there are, there's one that is almost exclusively found on uh, Grand Staircase, uh, actually two species, uh, one called Atwoody Eye. Um, I know of some places that uh, are probably not on Grand Staircase Escalante, but vast majority of that species is only found on the Grand Staircase. Uh, a second one is the one I showed you in the sand dune, uh, they, that Amophilus. Um, the majority of those are found only on uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Grand Staircase as well. Okay, um, so we have a couple questions uh, for, that are related um, from Ken and Marla. Uh, so could you address some of the uses of the plant by wildlife and humans? And Marla asked, um, do we know how some of the native tribes in Utah used Penstemon? Um, we don't have as many records that said, uh, I, there are some Navajo, and they are in Utah, and there's some Navajo traditions, the Hopi, which I think uh, you could consider in the southern part of the state coming across the border. 
Um, and so there are some of those. Um, trying to remember on those specifically, the uh, um, Barbados, that red one, the earliest one found recorded uh, found in Utah. That one, um, the Hopis have used that uh, for a number of things. Actually, most of those tribes from that region have used it. There's a long, uh, a, a long paragraph on that in the book that describes the various records that we found recorded about it. Uh, one of the things that we struggled with and we were actually criticized early on with the book was, what about what the Native Americans are using today? Well, we actually, they're, they're not writing about it. So I, we don't know mm -hmm. if they're using them. They still could be using them. All we can look at is historical records, uh, people that have written in the past. Uh, I met someone one time when I was there in, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the town. Anyway, it's uh, just in Ari over the edge of the border in Arizona down there. And I met him and he said, what was I doing? I told him I was looking at, he said, oh, I love Pensamon. And he said, and he had Native American in his blood. And he talked about that he had learned. I said, so which Pensamon are you using? He says, oh, I just used any of them. And, and he was using for this and, and for that. Uh, various ones are noted for um, um, very good um, and interesting. They're actually being continued to look at today as possible natural sources of, um, of medications. We briefly talk about that in the book. There's quite a bit of publicity uh, on that. I did not search that hard. I was not something I, I drove at, except to try and give you a taste of what might exist. Sure. Well, maybe we'll we'll be able to have an ethnobotany lecture from someone in the future. Oh, um, so I now have a couple of questions uh, related to um, what risks uh, Pensamen might face or what might threaten their diversity. Um, from Brad and an anonymous question asker, um, especially with regard to human factors such as land management policy. Um, and climate change, uh, off-road vehicle use, grazing, any number of those things. Right. So what are, what are the, those that are strongly impacting? It really depends on the species. Uh, species dependent, how we'd have this conversation. There are some species I know that are being impacted by grazing, uh, just by the nature of where the grazing is taking place. And the fact that that particular species really, really loves growing in, uh, in those areas. Um, road building, uh, strangely enough, road building has been an, an, uh, a good thing for Penstemon, if you will, um, because Penstemon generally are referred to as a pioneering species. By that, I mean, they will, they will start to grow when the land is disturbed. Well, you disturb the land when you do a road cut. And so if you want to find out where Pensamen are, drive down the highway and all of a sudden you see something bright on the side and you st if you've got your eye calibrated for a Pensamen, oh, I'll bet that's such and such and you run over there and you could walk back into the woods quite a ways before you'd find just some of the natural material growing. But as mo the moment you've disturbed that land, then you got a whole big little patch of them growing right there along the roadside. <laughs> so, uh, and I don't, I'm not saying let's go build roads all across the West. Please don't, I didn't say that. I'm just saying <laughs> they take advantage of those, those kinds of opportunities. Um, I, uh, the ones I've noticed the most have, uh, have been impacted with grazing um, and some of them uh, could be far more impacted. And it, the, these species vary so much in their habitat, even though they're generally a drought tolerant uh, type. Uh, let me give you, for instance, um, out on Highway 6 as you head uh, towards uh, leave Delta and head uh, west to, to Nevada. Just as you get to the Nevada border area, there's uh, a little f a f a bit of flatland. And if in the springs when it gets uh, rainy, that is, oh, that's, I don't want to get my feet out there because you just become bogged down. It is mucky, mucky, heavy clay. But that's where that one penciman loves to grow, is in that mucky, uh, heavy clay. Um, and yet, if we took that one that's down there by you guys that I just mentioned up there in the blowout sand, neither one of them would be happy switching places with each other. They're so mm. different from 
from each other. And we can continue with that kind of comparisons. There are some species such as um, one called Strictus or Rocky Mountain Penstemon. That's a robust thing. Oh boy, you can't, you can't hardly kill that. I've worked with that with lots of seed in the lab and it is probably one of the most robust plants I've ever dealt with. We, what we were trying to do is do a study asking uh, whether or not the genetics would uh, double the chromosomes because we're finding that. And could we do that with, with this particular one? Well, there was a treatment. And you always use um, a 50% kill rate, meaning you got 100 seed at the 50% kill rate. That's probably when you're starting to see changes. That's when you can actually see an alteration. I never found the 50% kill rate. I got it higher and higher and higher and higher. And I finally give up and said, well, I, this is ridiculous. We've got pressure really high. We've got the concentration and we've got it in there for three days and, and uh, we're getting virtually all the seed to, to germinate. Now that's just unheard of with anything else. So I've told you everything from a, a, a kind of an ephemeral type to one that, that's robust as all get out. So it really, really depends mm -hmm. on the species, the location, the pressures that are taking place at that location. Um, one called Idahoensis, um, if it were in, um, if it were in a, a bigger populated area, it would be wiped out really, really easily. Mm. Because it just is such a narrow uh, where it likes to live. Um, and that's the one up there by Utah, uh, Idaho, and Nevada. And it's way out there in the boondocks. It's uh, yeah, it's a long ways. Our, it's over, over an hour dirt, dirt, uh, dirt road to get to anything of any size. So, Great. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, so now we have a few questions um, around cultivation. So Carolyn asks, have you been able to hybrid, hybridize any penstemon species for horticultural trade yet? How long until we see some of your creations? Ah. Well, that's the one I have a lot of interest in because I believe this is an excellent source. And I know that I just upset some people. I apologize. I, I've worked too long in the horticulture industry. I, I, most people want things that bloom all summer and all that. Uh, I, we have developed some interesting things. We are in the breeding world. When you start work with breeding, it takes a long time when you start out with uh, just raw wild. Now, my goals are to have something that would be bloom all summer. Uh, that's a big objective. That's a huge objective, number one. Number two, I don't want it growing rangy, long and lanky because uh, most people in their home gardens won't put up with that. So, and I know I've, I've just, uh, uh, honestly folks, I understand both sides. I've worked with the wild types and I've worked with, with uh, the, the homeowner who just is persnickety as all get out and it just has to be a particular blue as she would describe to me when I was running my business many years ago. So I understand what most homeowners want and we're, I'm aiming for getting something into the marketplace that could be used by homeowners and we could cut down on the use of our water and they could still have pretty plants. So that's my goals. So to answer Carolyn, uh, there, it's a ways away. I have I uh, made a cross a couple of years ago, and yes, I've hybridized, white hybridized, a number. Penstemon are very good at hybridizing across uh, the genera. Um, not everything will cross with everything, but many will. Uh, like I told you about Jonesy Eye, that, that one was really easy to do, and it has a beautiful color. Um, but I hybridized one a couple of years ago, and uh, as my colleague put it, he says, ah, he says, that would be wonderful for uh, the cottage industry and so we had a long conversation. This one grow, grew to about, um, about 26 to 30 inches tall, but it was what I called in the business sparse, meaning that there were no leaves. The leaves were, were almost thread-like, uh, very, very narrow leaf. Uh, the flowers, uh, however, started blooming in June and was continuing to bloom into October when I gave a presentation about uh, uh, that. Now, when I find something that can bloom that long, and I don't mean one bloom being on there that long, I mean it continually produced blooms for that long a period. Now that is a real winner, but it is, it's just not beautiful enough to go for it. But that tells me I can do it. It tells me that the genetics of plasticity are there enough to go for those kinds of numbers. Great, thank you. Our next question from Ken is, how do pins to men propagate and how easy is it to cultivate them? 
depending on the species, again, because uh, it really varies, uh, Penstemon strictus, Rocky Mountain Penstemon, the one I was talking about a minute ago, that one is faithfully cultivated all over the place and you can buy bags of seed into pounds. That's why we got it and we could experiment with it uh, uh, quite easily. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful penstemon. I do love it. Uh, I think it's quite nice. Uh, that one's an easy one to grow. Um, it, uh, there are, uh, one, of my, uh, one of them that's called Penstemon compactus. And the name implies exactly what it's like. It's a very compact species. Uh, very strong blue. Uh, it's uh, 8 to 12, 12 inches tall uh, and the whole upper half of it, it just blooms when it blooms. It's just solid blue blooms and it's sky blue, a uh, rich sky blue. Uh, so it's quite beautiful. And so my colleague and I, Steve Love, the co-author, he says, please send me some seed of that. And so I sent him a big grundle of seed up and he's not been able to yet get it to germinate. Yeah. So we're still working on why is that not working? And was that just a bad season? And the answer could be yes. When you look, uh, that, uh, by the way, all of you, if you're really driven to be interested in uh, Pensament, there is a society and it's really inexpensive to get involved with. It's $15 a year. Uh, I mean, that's, that's just a, a, a backbreaker, but it is uh, loaded. And I, I was the one that actually went from 19, uh, uh, started with the earliest bulletins in 1946 and I've, uh, I've got them all uh, mimeographed or uh, photocopied. They're now online. So you can look at all of these old things online and look up all of the, the different kinds of species. We're still working on getting them organized so that indexed so that they're easy to do. That's gonna take us a while. But that's what a lot of where I got my information. So it really, really varies. The answer is yes. There's some that are really robust, easy to do. Others very difficult and challenging to work on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is, do penstemon complement growth of other species of plants and how? Uh, and this was in the context of gardens landscaping. Oh, do they complement? Absolutely. It depends on what you've got out there. Um, I, I, I guess um, I have a, a, a skewed way of looking at life. My grandfather always told, uh, said, uh, you can't make a mess with flowers. He, he loved a mix and he loved them all over. And I kind of joined him with that feeling. Uh, he was the one that I grew up with the greenhouse and yeah, it was uh, that, and I still look at him. I still think you can. I think the biggest problem is, is growing a short one in behind a tall one and then you can't see it. So you gotta be careful with that. Uh, they do complement their, uh, they, sometimes they do very well in the presence in the shade uh, or as having other plants as their nurse plant kind of mm -hmm. thing on the species. Okay. Um, and what's, I guess this probably varies by species as well, but uh, we had another question, what's their ideal growing season? Uh, their ideal growing season, uh, if, if you get the one from up in the Uintas and you grow it down here, as soon as the snow breaks, it'll pop, uh, start into blooming. Uh, then you can, uh, uh, if you have a little bit of water, and I don't mean a lot, just a trickle of water, uh, available to them off and on. You can get some plants if you'll uh, have them, uh, deadhead them back, remove the old flowers um, and uh, deadhead them. They will continue to uh, uh, reproduce blooms right in through fall. Um, um, eat and I uh, found various selections of eat and I or the firecracker penstemon to do that. Um, there's a, a mat penstemon right down near you guys. In fact, it's, it's there, it was named by that of Canab area. It's called uh, Thompsonii, Thompson's pen, penstemon. It's a little tiny mat. I've never seen that bloom in the fall in any condition. However, I was moving um, out across, and I can't remember the name of the dirt road that heads out towards the Grand Canyon, just south of you guys. You go down through Fredonia, and then you uh, pass through Fredonia, go on a uh, the turn to the right to head uh, to the west for a short distance, and then catch a, a dirt road, or it's an oil for ways. It turns into a, a dirt I had way out through there and run onto these Thompsonii growing out through there and we uh, saw some uh, Pomeroy. So I stopped to take a look at it and this was in October. So we got looking around and all of a sudden I found a full patch of that Thompsonii in bloom. So it tells you there's variation even among the ones you normally don't think would come to bloom in the fall. So there's variation even there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, uh, we have a question from Jonathan. Uh, he says, I heard that the family Pensamins belong to is undergoing reorganization due to new genetic research. 
And is that reorganization relevant to Penn Cements? Uh, it actually underwent it um, uh, uh, right at the turn of the, de uh, uh, of the uh, century, right around 2000, 2004, right in five, somewhere through there, they uh, pulled it out of uh, Scrofillaria AC and moved it into uh, Plantagen AC. Um, we have done a bunch of research and there's some others that are kind of in agreement that it's not really a good fit inside of Plantagen AC. Now, uh, if my student will finish writing up what he's got uh, going, and you and I just had a wonderful conversation <laughs> about this, uh, but if you'll get that written up, he'll provide a bunch of data that supports exactly that idea that uh, pensmen do not belong with, with Plantagenaceae. Plan, the planta Plantago, that group, should be by itself, and pensmen should be by themselves. Mm. I think there, there's that conversation, somebody's going to re-bring this back up again because the data are pushing us that way. Well, let's get your student to hurry up and finish his writing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our next question from Sage, um, he says, I've always admired mountain bluebells, not aware that they are pensamen. Are pensamen elevation specific or can varieties adapt to ecological changes? Um, I, I've found that I've been able to get anything that I've taken from the wild, if I'll take a cutting of it uh, and bring it down to the greenhouse, I can usually get it growing. And most of them will seed and uh, even start from seed in the greenhouse. Uh, sometimes I have to play with them and do some uh, little bit of uh, tweaking on this or that to get them to grow. So they are in nature, most definitely elevation, soil, all sorts of things specific. Some of them are extremely narrowly specific, some of these uh, uh, species. Uh, but if a person tries, many times they can get them at least to grow for a while in their gardens uh, of, of all sorts of the species. Great. Um, so we have a couple questions about, uh, related to fire. Um, so AJ asked, do you think we should add penstemon to wildfire seed mixes? Um, if they propagate easily and there are robust species types, perhaps they would help restoration efforts. And relatedly, Mike asked, in general, do penstemon respond positively to fire? Oh, uh, in general, I don't know as I dare answer that, but they have been looked at uh, for fire protection. They are listed in some areas as being the type of plant you should be growing in fire-prone uh, 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 home uh, homeowner uh, locations, you know, and uh, they are being looked at and are uh, being positive. For restoration purposes, a number of them are being looked at. In fact, my student is funded from the fire agency to look at uh, one out of uh, southern Idaho and northern Utah for that very specific purpose. He is, uh, his project has been looking at one called the Blue Penstemon, uh, that's found in the Snake River Valley and extends on down in through central Utah, very close relatives, and they are growing those for restoration kind of purposes. I actually, my department, the one I just retired from, uh, that's their specialty, a bunch, there's several scientists there, and um, the biggest challenge is that most forbs, meaning the broad leaves, uh, are really quite challenging to uh, get them to um, germinate and grow in the wild. And that has been uh, a big nemesis uh, for uh, across the board on all broadleaves. Uh, some some pensamen are really challenging uh, to, to have that happen. Uh, Eaton's uh, pensamen is being used uh, 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 broadly. In fact, it is used now clear up into the edge of Canada and its northernmost natural borders right here in central Utah, right in the canyon just north of where I live right now. So it's furthermost natural northern. But it's, it's now written up in several books as being um, so common in Idaho that it's, it's written up as one of the penstemon of Idaho. So <laughs> even though it's not native. So yeah, yeah. You look at, they are continuing. And that's where some of our funding came from and some of the research towards those angles. Great, thank you. Um, well, I just want to thank you so much for the time that you spent with us. Uh, 
this evening. I've heard that if you become a Pensaman enthusiast, you're a Pensamaniac. Is that true? That's correct. And then, uh, like I said, you need to get online and look up that group. It's uh, Good. Uh, they're they are on there. They're a dot org. Uh, so uh, you can uh, you can check them out. Right. So. so our our very last question from Carolyn. Uh, if this is answerable, what is your favorite Pensamen species? <laughs> Boy, I don't know. Oh, I think that, that uh, gosh, that would be just unfair because I, I look at the cover of the book and I love that Utah Pensamen, which is uh, uh, down there in your area. But I, um, I don't know. I've been in a very close call of running off the road a number of times because I see a beautiful Pensamen. So... I, I don't know. <laughs> Understandable. We won't force you to pick. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think they're all, they all have their own beauty. So Carolyn, sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. And thanks again, Mike, uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and I hope y'all will join for our next event next okay. month. Thanks.